The uh, Subcommittee on Space and Science will come to order. Uh, today marks this subcommittee's second hearing examining this today U.S. leadership in space. Timely and critical discussion, uh, really uh, timely and critical discussion uh, following the recent launch of advanced Chinese aircraft. Um, we all recognize that NASA is a key agency for a number of programs, but especially uh, important to civil and commercial space sector, enabling us to manage our international relationships in space. Congress last authorized a NASA authorization bill in 2017. We are absolutely thrilled that President Biden has confided in Senator Nelson and, and designated him to lead NASA uh, as the administrator. Uh, together, hopefully in close cooperation, we can uh, accomplish uh, national goals uh, within this, what we call the last frontier. Dating back through into the Cold War, space competition was primarily between Americans and Soviets. Today, 40 nations have a space agency of some sort. Competition also exists between commercial space companies from a number of different nations. The hearing today will examine several critical issues facing dom domain. One, how do we ensure the Artemis program uh, remains competitive, on budget, on schedule, so that lunar landings can become a, a, a future reality that we can schedule with confidence? Are we going to be able to have spaceships or space suits uh, developed in time? The Artemis mission is crucial to maintaining what I think of as the international confidence in America's ability to, leader, to be a leader uh, in, in space. Next question is, how do we ensure NASA's long-term continuity of purpose? Make sure that it's supported with sufficient appropriations by Congress and can transcend presidential administrations, that we can get to secure funding that not just this country, but that the world will recognize as continuity. Another question we will address is the U.S. future in low Earth orbit after the International Space Station, the ISS. The annual cost now is approaching almost $4 billion annually uh, just in operations. There are other commercial outposts under development, but there's still questions about how this will all shake out. We're also going to look at how space traffic management, STM, uh, impacts U.S. missions in LEO, in low Earth orbit. How do we mitigate orbital debris to make sure that we have sustainability in our commercial space industry? The subcommittee is going to have to develop new legislation to, to, to actively remediate some of the debris that's already up there, which brings the question again of how does space exploration and research get accomplished? How do we bring nations together in common purpose? How do we strengthen science, accelerate innovation and discovery? Senate passed NASA reauthorization in the Bipartisan U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, USICA, although I still prefer the Endless Frontier Act. You're here. <laughs> Space and Science Committee will continue developing upcoming legislation to, to support NASA missions and make sure that, that we find that continuity of funding. Um, Delighted to welcome the panel, the Honorable Jim Bridenstine, former NASA Administrator under the Trump Administration, former U.S. Representative from Oklahoma, uh, Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar uh, from the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, 
Someday I want to be associated with a coalition for deep space exploration. <laughs> uh, she served as senior policy advisor for the ISS National Laboratory. Mr. Mike Gold of Redwire Space, former associate administrator for space policy and partnerships at NASA. And Dr. Patricia Sanders, chair of the NASA Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, former executive director of our Missile Defense Agency. I want to thank each of you to, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us here. Uh, I want to make sure that, that the conversation we have takes advantage of all of your diverse experiences and perspectives. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, now I will turn it over to Ranking Member Lummis uh, for her opening comments. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's so nice that we finally get to do this hearing. We were hoping to do it in Colorado Springs in August. Uh, and it would have been so nice to be in your beautiful state uh, then. But uh, I'm so delighted that we're getting to do this now. This is such a distinguished panel of witnesses. And there's so much to learn for policymakers. And uh, we rely so heavily on you uh, to brief us, guide us, and support our efforts to support our space mission. So thank you so much. I'm so glad you got over your COVID and, um, and uh, we're all back together again. Um, this group of panelists is, is so exceptional. So thank you for your flexibility in working with us through um, the change and your willingness to be here today to speak with us. Um, your expertise is something we just welcome. Uh, so. Very, very nice to have you here today and finally get to do this. NASA has a long history of working with international partners, and of course, that's by design. The legislation that created NASA called for it to pursue cooperation with other nations and groups of nations. Our international partnerships have grown since NASA's creation, and the success of the International Space Station speaks to the ways in which cooperation in space has strengthened our relationships on Earth. Uh, in fact, the first time I got to go uh, to Russia, to Moscow, um, it was for the purpose of meeting with U.S. astronauts and Russian astronauts who were there working together uh, in, uh, in Russia. Even in times of tension on Earth, American and Russian astronauts were able to work together at the International Space Station. Now five space agencies are part of the ISS project. The ISS will soon reach the end of its lifespan, but it cannot mark the end of our partnership. New opportunities and challenges await us as we step into the era of the Artemis program and the Lunar Gateway and eventually human exploration of Mars. While we embark on new adventures, we, along with every other spacefaring nation, must use them as opportunities to manage the challenge of space debris. We must smirk together to ensure we both remove orbital debris and design equipment and policies to help cut back on the potential for orbital debris. I'm encouraged by efforts in the private sector to step up and help with this problem, and I intend to work with my colleagues on solutions at the congressional level to help tackle the issue. There are other challenges as well. Space is not only an area for collaboration, Competition in space looms large, and we must work to avoid a Cold War-style space race. Unfortunately, it seems some countries are less committed to this than others. Some nations don't seem interested in differentiating between military and civilian space operations. This week, we heard reports that over the summer, China launched a hypersonic glide vehicle that circled the Earth in low orbit and re-entered the atmosphere. China's labeling this test of a nuclear-capable weapon a routine test of a space vehicle underlines their unwillingness to separate military and civilian activities in space. I suspect this trend will continue, and it will become increasingly more difficult for the US to view advancements made in space by China as anything other than a threat to our security. To that end, the United States must continue to pursue policies that make it the preferred partner for all other spacefaring nations and help to set norms that promote access, the sharing of scientific advancement, 
and neighborly attitudes towards other countries' assets in space. So I'm very much looking forward to this hearing and learning from our distinguished panelists about these issues. I'm sure we are going to learn so much today that I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Lummis. Uh, appreciate having Wyoming and Colorado uh, run this committee. Uh, you've been a great partner and continue to be a great partner. Uh, now I will recognize Ranking Member Wicker for his opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lummis, um, I came down with COVID the same time as Senator Hickenlooper. I hope you're just as delighted that I got over it. I, I, I guess it just goes without saying. But I am glad to, and as a matter of fact, I, uh, Senator Hickenlooper, I've, I've found out how finally to get uh, on the first few minutes of NBC Nightly News, and that's to have uh, an independent, a Republican, and a Democrat all come down with COVID on the same day. Uh, this morning's hearing will address topics related to international cooperation and competition in outer space, um, it, decades of U.S. cooperation in space with other nations has enhanced America's leadership in science and technology and strengthened ties with international partners. We want to continue that. NASA has been involved in thousands of cooperative activities with over 100 countries, including 20 years of sustained human presence aboard the International Space Station. Even during the height of the Cold War, as Senator Lummis mentioned, the uh, space proved to be a rare area of cooperation between the US and the USSR. Although space can bring nations together, the space domain has become increasingly competitive. Today, we are in a new space race with China. Beijing is seeking to secure both the lunar high ground and low Earth orbit, LEO, to supersede the US as the dominant space power. This year, China launched the first module of its space station and is eagerly soliciting international partners. Cooperative endeavors with other nations and the private sector will play a key role in helping America confront China's space challenge. NASA's Artemis Deep Space Exploration Program has already been critical in promoting U.S. leadership and cementing our alliances in space. Artemis will return astronauts to the surface of the moon and, and build uh, cheers from the audience and um, build a sustained presence there in preparation for future human exploration of Mars in this decade. Rather than going it alone, the Artemis program envisions major contributions from international partners such as Canada, European unions, and European nations, and Japan. In addition to relying on other nations, Artemis will also employ unique capabilities offered by commercial space companies for key aspects of its mission. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on both the opportunities and the challenges NASA faces in competing against China, as well as carrying out the International Commercial Partnerships, or Artemis, the International Space Station, and other programs. NASA needs clear congressional reauthorization and direction to keep Art Artemis on track and support other cooperative efforts. And I'm delighted to report uh, to you all that this is a... Um, a, a, a priority of the chair of the full committee, and I appreciate her efforts in this regard. The committee's NASA Authorization Act, which passes part of the Endless Frontier Act, includes many provisions to accomplish those goals. I'm proud to have worked with Senators Cantwell and others on the NASA bill. I hope my colleagues in the House will work with us. Let's find a space vehicle to attach that NASA bill to and get it signed into law at, at this pivotal time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, we will have to uh, find a space vehicle for the attachment. Um, now we can hear from our witnesses with their opening statements. Uh, I think we can start with the Honorable Jim Bridenstine. 
Thank you, Chairman Hickenlooper, uh, Ranking Member Lummis, Ranking Member Wicker, and Senator Moran. It's great to be back in Washington, D.C., testifying before this committee. I want to thank this committee for the strong, apolitical, bipartisan support that this committee has shown to NASA and its agenda. I think that's critically important for a, a lot of reasons. When you're doing projects that take multiple decades in, in nature, we have to have continuity of purpose. Um, continuity of purpose requires Congress to engage, be involved, and support the efforts of NASA in an apolitical, bipartisan way. And when that happens, this is the most important thing, when that happens, we are able to achieve international cooperation in a way that is often very difficult. So when we think about the history, think about the vision for space exploration, the Constellation program, um, and the cancellation thereof. We think about the Space Exploration Initiative back in uh, the 90s and the cancellation thereof. When these things happen, it has, it has an effect on our international partners that is chilling, and they then choose, in many cases, not to partner with us, and that's a problem. But what I will say is that if you look back at 2017, we passed the NASA Transition Authorization Act in a bipartisan way, House and Senate. It was signed by the president in 2017. Um, and of course, uh, the current NASA administrator, uh, then senator, came to that event in a bipartisan way to say, look, NASA needs to have continuity of purpose. So passing an authorization bill, in my view, is critically important. We have to have that to demonstrate to the world that, that we have resolve as a nation to accomplish these very impressive things and to stay ahead of our competitors. So that's, I think, probably the highest order of priority, getting that authorization passed. Second thing I would like to say, and this is, I think, maybe even more important than the first as when you think about the future, and that is the challenge with space debris. And Senator Hickenlooper, you, you nailed that right on the head. Uh, it's a big problem. Um, and it's an even bigger problem when you think about the massive constellations that are being launched into low Earth orbit even right now. So we think about how the FCC licenses these constellations. They look at a constellation, let's pretend it's 15,000 satellites large, and they say there's a certain percentage of those satellites that are going to not be able to maneuver and not be able to re-enter. In other words, they become derelict. And they say they apply a 1.5% chance for every satellite. So if you launch 15,000 satellites, that's 225 satellites that are derelict. And then they say there's an aggregate collision risk for those 225 satellites. And they, they came up with a, a, a probability for a 15,000 satellite constellation that said there's a 1 in 44 chance of a, of a collision in space. Here's the fundamental flaw with that. It only includes derelict satellites, which are 1.5% of the satellites. There is still a probability of collision for the other 98.5% you know, of the thousands of constellation satellites in that particular constellation. We don't know what that is. They have a maneuver capability. That's, we don't know what that probability is. But let's say there's a, a collision that's going to happen that is um, a 1 in 10,000 chance of a collision. And if you maneuver, that probability goes down to 1 in a million. That's fantastic. We love that. We don't know that that's the case. And so we're licensing satellites right now. Not no, it's, it's a known unknown. And yet we're still licensing the constellations, which I think is not a good idea, but at the same time, um, here's what we do know. If it, if it goes down to one in a million, which we don't know, but let's pretend, and that eventuality happens 10 million times, that means there's going to be 10 collisions. <laughs> so, so if the probability goes down to one in a million and there's 10 million maneuvers, then there's 10 collisions. This is a, this is a massive problem. And by the way, I want to be clear. It goes beyond that. When we start talking about these constellations, the, we're only talking about satellites that we know that exist and debris that we know that exists. For everything that we can track that's 10 centimeters or bigger, there's 10 to 100 things that we can't track that are equally lethal. The, what I'm saying is that the, the challenge is much bigger than we know, but we know that we don't have any idea what that risk is. And yet we're still launching these and licensing these massive constellations without knowing what the, what the risk really is. And I, I, I'm telling you, it's much higher than what the FCC is currently predicting. I will also tell you, um, on the 1.5% derelict satellites, it's, that's, a, that's not right. It's going to be higher than 1.5% that can't re-enter. Um, finally, I will say this. Just, I think it was last night, uh, somebody here can testify. Rwanda just filed for a constellation 
of 327,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. Recently, you had Spain uh, file for a constellation that's 70,000 satellites. And of course, right now we've got Starlink and Kuiper and we've got OneWeb. We've got the European Union, they wanna have their constellation. China, Russia, they all have these massive constellations for low latency, high throughput communications, which by the way, I support, but we don't wanna destroy space in order to achieve it, which is what I am concerned about. The challenge is that there are, there, there are things that we absolutely know that we don't know, and we're still moving forward at a very rapid pace, and it is a very uh, big concern in my view. Orbital debris is number two, and I know I'm running out of time here quickly, but two other things that are important. Um, I think it was mentioned by a number of senators. Uh, we have to have a replacement for the International Space Station. We love it. I know this committee passed an authorization bill out of the Senate that actually has it, no kidding, at um, uh, you know going to 2030. That is a good thing. I would also tell you that there's no guarantee it's gonna last that long, and China just launched a brand new space station. That's another big problem. We cannot seed. We don't know the value of microgravity at this point, but what we do know is that if, if, we, don't, if we lose the ISS and don't have a replacement, we're gonna be in trouble. Third thing, I think it's important to have two providers for the human landing system, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Jim, appreciate that. Dr. Dittmar. Chair Hickenlooper, Ranking Member Lummis, um, Senator Moran, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the subcommittee, thanks for the invitation to appear before you today. It's nice to be back in front of this committee um, with such a distinguished panel uh, to discuss my thoughts on the topic of today's hearing. I am the former president and CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, but I am now the executive vice president of Axiom Space, which is building the world's first commercial space station. So I wish to note that while I'm gonna discuss some of Axiom's plans as to, to illustrate my discussion, the positions that are presented here are my own and do not represent the official opinion of my employer. With that out of the way, my discussion will focus on competition, that aspect of today's hearing. It's often said that we're an inflection point in space, and while that's true, the phrase glosses over complexities, challenges, and opportunities already pointed out that confront us now and in the years to come. What is less frequently discussed is a more dangerous reality, namely that if the United States does not act decisively and strategically, it risks squandering the competitive moat that it has built around commercial space to national actors who continue to maintain laser focus on asserting their own national interests. Axiom is the first and so far only company to develop a new space station destined for low Earth orbit without government funds for development, launch, or operations. Beginning in, by building modules that extend the functionality of the ISS, it will provide capabilities for a broad array of users, researchers, astronauts, um, government, international customers, and the business community. Critically for the purposes of this hearing, it is also, in my opinion, best, best positioned to help challenge China's interests in LEO at the end of life of the, inter of the International Space Station. And indeed, it was for that latter reason more than any other that I joined Axiom. It is tremendously important for the U.S. government to recognize and respond with urgency to the situation our nation and space industry is facing. Simply put, it is China's goal to establish a leading position in the economic and military use of outer space, as they have stated publicly for many years. China recognizes the immense strategic value of space and intends to seize the opportunity to develop economic value by dominating a space-based economy. Space has become part of China's Silk Road economic belt, part of its plan for geopolitical and economic dominance. In my written testimony, I refer to the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission's 2019 report to Congress, which offers the comprehensive analysis of what Beijing calls its space dream and how it hopes to achieve it. China is playing the long game, make no mistake, bolstering their space capabilities through military-civil fusion and through the exploitation of weaknesses in the U.S. space industrial base, in our glacial pace of acquisition and procurement, and of the stovepipe nature of our national agencies. With regard to LEO, NASA, and by extension its stakeholders, are facing uncertainty. Plans to tr transition off the ISS at the end of its life require clearly stated objectives, realistic timelines with milestones, and a firm commitment that has not yet been adequately communicated. At present, NASA is describing its objectives partly in terms of continued access to LEO, envisioning hardware development under its new commercial LEO destinations program using the same acquisition strategy that works so well for commercial orbital transportation system, COTS, and eventually for commercial crew. 
There are several differences between the circumstances that gave rise to COTS over a decade ago, however, and those in low Earth orbit now. COTS was able to leverage an existing market for launch services that had developed and diversified over 50 years to include an understanding of hardware development and a substantial customer portfolio in both government and commercial sectors. COTS was also set up to meet transportation needs that were communicated early in the program. Today, conditions are markedly different. While now as then, hardware development is relatively well understood, there is no diversified market in LEO to leverage, not yet. NASA has yet to clearly define its needs for services after the ISS ends, nor does it plan to do so for some time. And finally, we face a formidable competitor. At the very same time that NASA is embarking on this approach, American companies have admitted to losing customers to China as it employs strategies to undercut the U.S. commercial space sector through mechanisms such as state-backed financing that market-driven companies in the U.S. cannot compete with. In my view, an important national objective for LEO should be to counter potential Chinese hegemony in low Earth orbit. Should Congress choose to authorize LEO programs with this goal in mind, then NASA's acquisition approach should reflect this. It's unclear that the same procurement approach that worked for COTS in very different circumstances will work now. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about demand. Both industry and NASA believe that the market sector is ready to develop next generation orbital platforms. In Axiom's case, this confidence is shared by capital markets. In a few years, Axiom will see its modules attached to station, increasing capacity and capabilities for meaningful science and research. And I've got a quick visualization, if that's available to us to see, so you can see how that will go. Maybe not. Okay, moving on. However, Axiom and other companies providing services in LEO now or in the future are dependent upon sufficient demand to close their business cases. If there's not sufficient demand, then the very companies the U.S. is depending on to assure U.S. presence and soft power in the orbit may fail. In our system, governments don't create markets. They can only serve as customers. However, NASA can fund and conduct research that is too costly, risky, or difficult for industry to undertake and provide the results to industry for use in engaging with customers. If market development is to be a legitimate aim of space policy, much as it is, for example, state and commerce, particularly if it is to underpin pursuit of a range of national as well as business goals, we might also ask if NASA is the appropriate home for that policy. NASA is not an economic development agency, and we should not expect it to act as one. The space agency that serves this country so well has core competence revolving around science, exploration, education, and technology. At the same time as a nation, we must think and act deliberately with regard to the intersection between markets and space policy. In my written testimony, I offer several suggestions and recommendations that the committee may consider regarding how government may help. It's been a pleasure and an honor to appear before you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Dittmar. Now, before I introduce Mr. Gold, I want to uh, ask for unanimous consent to enter the following document into the record. It's an article from Space News uh, authored by Mr. Gold titled, the Mine, it's titled Mind the Gap in Low Earth Orbit. So if we can... Ask for unanimous consent. All in favor say aye. aye. So be it. Now, Dr. Or Mr. Gold, this, the floor is yours. Thank you, Senator. Perhaps we could uh, also enter the uh, visual that Dr. Dittmar Absolutely. is uh, trying to show us. Thank you, Senator Wigger. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'll speak for both myself and Redwire. My CEO is right behind me, so he can kick me if I get out of line. So I appreciate it. Again, uh, gratitude to uh, our chair, Senator Hickenlooper. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Ranking Member Lummis, to Committee Ranking Members Senator Wicker and Senator Moran, as well as my appreciation to the talented and intrepid staff that has helped support this hearing. Uh, and again, I want to say thank you for this extraordinarily important, timely topic of international collaboration and competition in space. We often think of space as a vacuum. The word space itself can be interpreted to mean nothing, but I prefer to think of space as everything. Space is what connects the moon to the earth and all of us to each other. The exploration of space unites this country and the world in a way no other endeavor can. And the desire to unite humanity is at the very heart of the Artemis mission. Through Artemis, NASA is assembling the largest broadest and most diverse international beyond low Earth orbit human spaceflight coalition in history. However, assembling this unprecedented international collaboration for Artemis was neither simple nor easy. 
due to the failure of every single Beyond LEO American human spaceflight initiative to come to fruition since Apollo, there is great skepticism among both partner and rival nations relative to NASA's ability to sustain a program to return astronauts to the surface of the moon. This is why, more than any other rocket engine or piece of technology, bipartisanship is the key to the success of Artemis. Without robust and ongoing bipartisan support, we will not be able to lead a global coalition to the moon, Mars, or any other destination. We cannot unite the world if we cannot first unite here in Congress, which is why a bipartisan NASA authorization bill is urgently needed to both reassure partner nations and send a message of unity of purpose to our rivals. I want to thank this committee for already passing NASA authorization language through the Senate as part of the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act and urge your counterparts in the House to proceed with alacrity so that the entire Congress can adopt a NASA authorization bill that strongly and explicitly endorses Artemis. Beyond technology that we develop via Artemis, the policy surrounding the program is just as important. America must lead in developing norms of behavior in space to ensure that the exploration and development of the moon and Mars is conducted in a safe, sustainable, and peaceful fashion. While at NASA, it was the privilege of my lifetime to craft and lead the development and successful adoption of the Artemis Accords, which have now been signed by 12 countries. The principles of the Accords, such as transparency, interoperability, due regard, avoiding harmful interference, the sustainable use of space resources, and mitigating debris are the foundation that humanity's future in space should be built upon. I hope that NASA continues to expand the family of nations that have adopted the accords, and that the agency focuses in particular on bringing in new partners from Africa and developing countries around the world, demonstrating that no matter how large or how modest their contributions are to Artemis, that all nations can join us in this unprecedented journey of discovery to the moon and Mars. Closer to Earth, the International Space Station continues to represent the pinnacle of global cooperation in human spaceflight. We must send a clear and unequivocal message to both partners and rivals that America will remain a leader in low Earth orbit by extending the ISS through 2030. At Redwire Space, which is the only company to successfully manufacture items on the ISS, we are focused on leveraging the unique nature of the microgravity environment to develop new technologies and innovations that will help to bolster global communications, that will heal the sick, and that will feed the hungry. Moreover, America must ensure that we do not suffer from a space station gap, which would see the scientific, economic, and diplomatic benefits of crude LEO operations to China. Therefore, in an upcoming authorization bill, we must provide robust support for the development and deployment by the private sector of a new commercial space station that will continue the legacy of the ISS, sustaining and expanding American international cooperation in low Earth orbit. While opportunities for collaboration are many and varied, we must also not lose sight of the ongoing technological competitions in space that America can ill afford to ignore. Specifically, the countries and companies that master orbital servicing, assembly, and manufacturing will be the economic and national security leaders of the future. I'm proud that at Redwire, through the development of systems such as Arconaut, a satellite that literally assembles itself in orbit, we are contributing to American competitiveness in this vital arena. However, much more needs to be done, and the upcoming NASA authorization should include explicit support for Arconaut and public-private partnerships generally that will result in even more ambitious technologies leveraging deployable structures, robotics, and 3D printing. We can, and I believe should engage with rival nations, including China, on norms of behavior in space, as well as benign cooperative scientific activities, such as lunar sample swaps and sharing climate data. However, constant vigilance is the price we pay for liberty, which is why I hope the Senate will continue to urge NASA to redouble the agency's support for public-private partnerships, which are the key to maintaining American competitiveness in space. The journey of Artemis and NASA is to the moon, Mars, and beyond. But if we properly balance collaboration and competition, 
the destination will be peace and prosperity. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And you didn't even mention the companies that Redwire has in Colorado. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say, since it's just between us, they're three of our best. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, now we're ready to hear from Dr. Sanders. Thank you, Senator Hickenlooper, Senator Loomis, Senator Wicker, and the members of the subcommittee. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss NASA's international collaboration and competition in space. The panel that I chair has a serious charge to provide both NASA and the Congress with advice for the intelligent management of the risks that are inherent in human spaceflight. Um, NASA has been at the forefront of human spaceflight for decades, formulating the missions, defining the requirements, executing the programs, performing management integration, and leading launch processing and mission operations. NASA still leads in human space exploration, but the agency's role is evolving with critical implications for safety and risk management. The agency is not the same as it was 10 years ago and will not be the same in even another five years. The rapid growth of commercial space services and increasing global interest in space have changed the environment and the landscape will not return where NASA is the only or even the major actor. This has tremendous upside potential and equally tremendous challenges for managing risk of human uh, space exploration. At the same time, the exploration endeavors NASA leads are ever more complex and have ever more risk involved. Um, NASA has been gradually and tactfully and successfully adjusting to a changing role and set of responsibilities as it shifts from principally executing its programs and missions to commercially and internationally acquiring significant key elements and services. But our panel firmly believes that NASA must now take a more strategic examination of the agency's evolution in the emerging environment while continuing to manage a safe and complex human exploration campaign. NASA's challenge is the melding of traditional and innovative approaches, including significant systems engineering and integration complexities and the certification of commercial human spaceflight capabilities with high levels of risk. There are clear advantages to leveraging industry innovators and international partners, but NASA must still manage and be responsible for the overall risks, even when the agency neither controls nor dictates the material solutions for all of the components. To do this, we believe that NASA first must determine how to exercise appropriate accountability or how to hold its vendors accountable for the safe and successful accomplishment of its mission. Secondly, we believe it is imperative to define the overall architecture for the highly complex Artemis mission. The agency should identify how each individual element, regardless of provider, fits the architecture and the top level requirements for each element to fill its necessary function in the overall structure. This should allow NASA to focus on the right set of priorities at the right time and to communicate expectations to all the contributors, um, internal, commercial, and international, in a consistent manner. Thirdly, all of this is complicated by the nation's current lack of comprehensive regulatory framework for human commercial spaceflight. NASA retains full accountability for its missions, but no external government regulations or standards exist to set a baseline level of expectation for the provider related to human safety. The few existing regulatory pieces leave a gap related to human on-orbit safety and the space industry that impacts human safety. And in particular, as has already been mentioned, there is an immediate and compelling need to designate an, a civil agency to oversee and coordinate space traffic management. Given the importance of space to international security, technological leadership, and international competitiveness, it is vital for the nation to act now to preserve the safety of space operations and their environment. In closing, I note some consistent advice themes from the panel. First, it is a need for a constancy of purpose, as mentioned, sustained commitment, and a clear understanding of the objectives. 
Second is the importance of setting challenging but achievable schedules and not allowing undue schedule pressure lead to decisions adversely impacting safety and mission assurance. And third is technical baselines and schedules that are mutually consistent, realistic, and achievable, and supported by adequate and stable resources. We encourage NASA, in partnership with the Congress, to hold fast to the foundations of risk management while embracing and not fearing alternative methods to achieving those fundamentals. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all for your, your comments and appreciate the, uh, the breadth of experience you bring to the table. Um, we'll now start a round of questions. Uh, each of us will get, um, uh, well, hopefully we'll get five minutes. We try to stay on schedule. It's always hard. Um, I always ask if, if in, in responding to a question, if you can keep it to a minute, that allows us to get four questions in. Um, if, if necessary, we can come back to a, a second round of questions, or there are so many questions to ask uh, each of you. Um, anyway, I'll start, uh, uh, and I'll start with Mr. Gold. Uh, appreciate your work at NASA uh, with the international partners in establishing these, uh, the Artemis Accords and that cooperative spirit. In your testimony that I looked at last night, you said space is a crucible that demands the formation of global coalitions. So how can Congress support NASA's goals to, to expand the coalition of international partners in space? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I can tell you, and I'm sure the former administrator would agree, NASA pays a lot of attention to Congress. And your rhetoric, you know, obviously legislation that's passed, you know, determines whether NASA is aggressive in going out and forming international coalitions or holds back and really what the agency does. So I think it's extremely important, again, in an authorization bill, that there be explicit encouragement to the agency, both to expand out international cooperation generally, as well as specifically to expand, again, the family of the Artemis Accords that there's so many countries that need to be involved, that the agency should be aggressively reaching out for. We need to lead by example and establish norms of behavior before there's conflict in space. And I know it's cliche, an ounce of prevention now will prevent a pound of trouble down the road. So including uh, even a sense of Congress about the accords, international growth, and being aggressive to establish norms of behavior, I think would be extremely helpful to assure a peaceful future. You know, other countries may or may not, you know, agree to the same norms that we do, but if we lead by example, we can take pressure there and create a coalition of the willing. Absolutely. That's, I think you're, you're spot on. I could not agree more. Absolutely. Um, and I want to take, and, and, and Mr. Gold talked to a little bit about this, the implications of a, of a, a gap. Uh, I guess, Dr. Dittmar, let me ask you, um, where do you see the, what are the implications if we do end up with a, a, a space station uh, gap where it, the United States is not taking a leadership position? So as, <clears throat> thank you for the question, Senator. Um, as has already been pointed out, China has a space station that's flying um, in, in low Earth orbit. This is actually their first module of a station that they're gonna build out. And China is leveraging that space station. They've formed partnerships with UNUSA. They've already, they recently announced that they had um, agreements to fly over 1,000 payloads. We've had American companies that have already said that they're beginning to lose customers to China and the Chinese station because the Chinese are using state authority to subsidize access um, to station for commercial customers as well. And so if what we're saying is that we want to have a follow-on station that's um, a privately, a public-private partnership or is owned by a private entity, that entity absolutely depends upon access to customers that are not being, in effect, stolen away by a state agency um, that's doing that you know, intentionally to sort of undermine that capability. The other thing, frankly, is that you know, robust presence in low Earth orbit for Americans has been um, a part of policy, whether stated or not, um, in the United States for more than 20 years. I'm um, actually longer than that. And going back to, to the origin of, of, of NASA, and when you look toward a, an authorization bill, I think it's really important to foot stomp that US presence in low Earth orbit is expected in perpetuity, that it is the policy of the United States um, that we will continue to do so through whatever means. 
Um, however, I think, uh, and, and, and low Earth orbit is frankly our foothold um, going out into outer space. We need continuity of human spaceflight and human activity beginning on the ground through low Earth orbit into deep space. And that chain is very, very important to American security, to American business, to American research and science, to American technology development. We cannot afford a gap. Yeah, well, we agree on that. Um, Dr. Sanders, the uh, GAO has expressed concern on the maturity of advanced lunar Spacesuits is a classic case, uh, but I think a lot of what all everyone's talked about, and especially uh, Mr. Bridenstine, uh, the 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 safety uh, of these missions is is there are risks from a, a hundred different directions. Um, and can, I was going to ask you to describe how you believe that that robust congressional funding, that that continuity of funding. Uh, uh, and authorizations could support, help NASA support the goals of safety and making sure that, you know, mission schedules uh, can end up impacting safety and, 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 uh, and assurance. Um, well, we've been a consistent proponent of uh, adequately resourcing all of the complex requirements necessary um, for safely execute. When resources are not adequate or not stable, um, the NASA and and the decision in their decision making process on designs end up making design choices that maybe are pre premature. Maybe they are um, uh, take um, risks that they wouldn't necessarily take if they didn't have to live within a resource that isn't adequate or they don't have the stability of the resources. Um, it forces um, to make choices sooner than you might want to take. It forces you to um, sometimes down select earlier than you understand all the implications of competing designs. And so it, it's very important to have the adequate resources and to have them in a stable fashion. Right. Great. I appreciate that. I'm already out of time. I can't believe how fast this goes by. But I, I have not done with all of you. Mr. Bride and you will get your <laughs> moment. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, our, the committee chair, uh, Senator Cantwell, who has been working on these issues for a long time, as long as probably longer than most of you, most of us. Anyway, let me turn it over to the to the chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Hickenlooper, and thanks for holding this subcommittee hearing, and to you and Senator Lummis for uh, spending so much time to try to bring focus to the needs for authorizations. And thank you to the witnesses. Um, I think I'll start with you, Mr. Bridenstine. Obviously, one of the past times you came before this committee, you spoke very fervently about the need for authorization. And yet it's been since 2017, since we've actually had an authorizing bill. So I sometimes feel like NASA wants to have the money without the authorization. That is, that it works not to resolve the conflicts that we have with members that basically it just realizes as long as you can just get the dollars, it's okay. Well, that's not okay. And so I just want to be clear with the panelists, if you could give me some feedback on some of these issues. Do you think that we need an authorization bill? Yes, 100%. Yes. An authorization bill is vital to send messages to our partners and rival nations for the unity purpose of Congress. Yes. Dr. Sanders? Yes. Okay. So do we need to uh, have more testing and analysis of uh, rocket launching and the capabilities that we're looking for in the next system? Do we need more testing and analysis? Yes. Um, uh, you can always have more testing. There's no doubt and more analysis. At some point, and I like the way Patricia Sanders mentioned it earlier, um, we have to manage risk. Um, so it, it depends on what system we're talking about, and, um, but certainly there's value to more testing. Dr. Dick Dittmer. Um, so having been involved in the development of the space station, I would just but echo what Jim said, which I'm was... I'm just talking about... I'll get to space stations in a minute. Specifically rockets? Yeah. No, what I was going to do is simply speak to engineering. Okay, so, so, so it's always useful to have test data, but um, there's also a, a appropriate use of test data and then a point at which just more and more testing simply has cost and schedule. Okay, Mr. Gold. Senator, this country hasn't had a human spaceflight program beyond low Earth orbit in a very, very long time. We are going to have to relearn some critical lessons, uh, as well as developing new technologies and new systems along the way. So 
testing and making sure that we have a safe system that's robust and effectively competes with China and other nations is going to be critical. Leveraging the wonderful private sector companies in your state, as well as those three that Senator Hickenlooper mentioned of Redwire in Colorado. Okay, D Dr. Sanders. Strong proponent for adequate testing and, um, and analysis. Um, as um, Mr. Bridenstine had said, it's not uh, possible ever to completely and fully, totally eliminate risk, and you want mm -hmm. to manage it. But the way to manage it is through knowledge. And we, as much knowledge as we think we have about systems, we continue to learn things mm -hmm. about parachutes, about compatibility of components. Do you um, think materials. NASA Houston needs to have more oversight over the Artemis program and its schedules and launches? I think there and is currently provided. I think I think there it, well oversight from uh, the the Congress or no from NASA Houston. Oh, from NASA Houston for the Artemis program. Yep. Um, well, certainly, there's a lot of different centers that are involved in the development of different components of the Artemis program. I think it's important that NASA has a robust capability to do um, the integration. Um, and I think uh, until recently, that has been lacking. But my understanding is, and I'm not there anymore, but my understanding is uh, they have really plussed up uh, the systems integration piece uh, that has been missing for a while. Dr. Dittmer. Uh, with apologies, Senator, I am not. Uh, as, as I, I'm not as current with what yeah. uh, management is distributed across the centers. Okay. I'm, I'm basically, I'm bringing up topics that are part of the dispute between what the Senate and the House wants to do on a NASA authorization. So I'm just trying to get your viewpoints on that because um, part of the issue is we have to debunk you know, where we are. We can't do an adequate oversight job if we don't have an authorization bill. We can't come back on the measurements if we don't have some input here about what kind of structure we need. But we're sitting here with obviously a new, as Mr. Gold was saying, a pretty big new adventure, at least from the number of stops we're talking about, and then uh, what we're talking about going beyond the moon. To say nothing of we really don't have any accurate dates or cost estimates or what we want out of each of these systems. What do we want out of the launch systems and the capabilities? What do we want out of the ISS and its capabilities? What do we want um, on the lander system? What do we want you know, on the beyond lander? So here we, I'm sorry, beyond the moon. So here we are having this discussion without reference and without oversight, really, because we don't have an authorization bill that is on a piece of paper, who's in charge, who's going to answer these questions, and how are we going to have this debate in Congress? So what's coming across is the amount of money that people want to keep going, but then it's always not enough. And then the choices that people make don't necessarily adhere to redundancy and resiliency. So I think it's just imperative that we get an authorization bill. And so I'm trying to figure out from you all what you think some of these stumbling blocks really truly are between our colleagues. So Mr. Bridenstine. Uh, Ma'am, I think I think that's all. I agree with everything you just said. Um, I think that's exactly right. And I would also say that one of the biggest authorization bill, big piece of it, but have continuity of purpose over time requires an apolitical bipartisan consensus on how we're moving forward. And and if we can put that in authorization bill, it sends a signal to everybody globally that we have resolved to accomplish these objectives. And then, as this hearing is titled, we have the opportunity to go get international partners. If we don't have that resolve, if the international partners don't trust that we're actually going to accomplish what we're saying we're going to accomplish, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go to China, which already has you know, they're, they're what they call the Chinese International Space Station. And now they've entered into an agreement with Russia for going to the moon and establishing a, a lunar base. Our international partners have a history of partnering with other nations when we don't have that continuity. So the authorization is important for that purpose too. Okay, Mr. Gold. Senator Cantwell, when Administrator Brian Stein sent me overseas to negotiate the gateway commitments, it was because of statements that you made that we were able to complete that negotiation. I was told outright by an international partner, why should I believe anything that you're saying relative to gateway, Artemis, and NASA's plans? And it was only by arguing the bipartisan support that Artemis had that we were able to bring them them from going over to China. Those doubts will continue. 
Well, one of the reasons why NASA's authorization is on the USICA, America's Competitiveness Bill, is because we've passed this twice now out of the Senate to have no results in the House. So we're very adamant here in a bipartisan fashion what needs to be done, and I'm just trying to use today as a way to figure out what is this stalemate that we have with our House colleagues truly about. Now, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about the, the nature of a public lander, um, that issue, but obviously that is one of the stumbling blocks as well, is that people would like to have a process and go back and look at a public lander, although I think some people are saying, um, you know, the IP would belong to the government, all sorts of, so how do we, how do we get a resolution uh, of this issue? Do we have other members waiting? Sorry. You, I think you are on such an important point. That, that, okay. That, 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 okay, thank you. I, I don't know if we have colleagues here, so I don't want to hold up somebody if they're on. No, you're, there's no, no, there's no one in the queue. Oh, thank you. Well, that's a, they're all voting. For, they're all the for the voting. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when we came to the moon, uh, I, we need to look back at the program and the commercial crew program. Uh, both of those have proven to be very resilient. Even when one partner had a, a challenge, the other one would step forward and continue to move forward. We saw that, you go back to 2014 on commercial resupply of the International Space Station. We saw, um, you know, at the time it was orbital ATK. They had a problem resupplying the International Space Station, a rocket failure. A lot of cargo blew up. Um, and then in 2015, SpaceX had a rocket blow up with the international docking adapter and, and other cargo. And, and, but we had a resilient program where we, could, we, we had dissimilar redundancy and we were able to use an Atlas rocket with a Cygnus cargo capability and, and basically resupply the International Space Station. And we had international partners on that, Japan, that helped you know, support the resupply and even Russia supported the resupply. So th the answer is we need dissimilar redundancy. Um, having a single provider for a human landing system, I think, imposes risk. That risk is budgetary. That risk is schedule. That risk is oversight. That risk is transparency. I think if if we have multiple that are competing on cost, on innovation, and those providers are getting customers that are not necessarily the government, I think that's a good thing for the program. I think that was the original intent. I think that's why when uh, you know, uh, Congress initially funded the Artemis program, there was an anticipation there would be two, at least two in the, in the competition. I was fully supportive of that, and that's what we were pushing for. Um, I'm, I'm more trying to get a, our colleague, uh, the, the chair of the House Committee, wants a public lander. And so I was trying to get comments about that. I, I think I, uh, I'm going to say things I've said before, and it's going to maybe get me in trouble with members of the House. I don't know. But I, I will tell you that I think any time you introduce a competition between the government and the private sector, um, the government wins and the private sector loses. I think that's a challenge. I think, I think we have enough commercial capability now to have two commercial human landing systems um, and I think if, if, if we had adequate funding, um, you know, whether it's coming from the executive branch that's not providing it or Congress, I think the adequate funding for two systems. Yeah. Senator, private sector. Health. PlayStation. And in Now is, as you mentioned, and direction, and those are two things that we certainly hope Congress will be providing via an authorization bill, and certainly we're advocating for the House to move and move quickly. Well, we're trying to resolve these issues. So the, the, the point you should take away in NASA, really, if they're listening, should take away is we need an authorization bill. We're not going to continue to have this game where you just get appropriations. It is not going to serve the Artemis program or NASA well. But we have to resolve this issue. And, and frankly, you know, it's frustrating to me to see the spirit of NASA turned into, you know, the, the, the cheering of billionaires or competition with each other because I'm pretty sure that that's not what our mission of Artemis is about. And so somehow we've gotten away from our focus you know, on what we're trying to do from a technology perspective. And I believe in NASA's uh, innovation and technology. I want them to apply the same spirit 
fixing the problems on the Apollo uh, project to fixing and getting this authorization done. But if we have to address this public issue and get our House colleagues in a room and figure out what is the sticking point here, uh, we should do better than just, just dismissing it and saying the, the, the private sector can do better. We just had this debate with the FAA and oversight of the aviation sector. We clearly saw where there were pitfalls. So we have to figure this out and, and resolve our differences so we can get legislation, so Congress can do its oversight job, so that Senator Hickenlooper can continue to play a great role here in, in pushing this. And then we can the international aspect of this. But right now, we're, um, you know, we're, it's been since 2017 since we've had a bill. And so you ask yourselves, why, why are we in this situation where the dates that are on a piece of paper right now make no sense as it relates to the Artemis program? Everybody knows that. So how is that a good strategy? So let's resolve these issues. Dr. Sanders, do you have any suggestions about how to resolve this issue about a public lander versus commercial landers? Do you have any input or Dr. Dittmar? Um, I, I think that, um, yes, the commercial um, industry is, is capable, increasingly capable, but NASA always still has to be accountable for what, for the success, success and the safety of their mission. So it's important for them to be able to have enough influence and, and interaction in order to have that, uh, ensure that accountability. And also, NASA has um, a, a great deal of experience, a great deal of talent great, from, that they've acquired over decades. And so there's a time for collaboration as, there, as this is going on. And, and we saw that in commercial crew. Um, there were times when SpaceX and there's times when Boeing have had, had problems to solve. Um, and NASA has been able to help them solve those because of the experience they have. So I don't think it's a, a clear, straight um, turn it over to commercial, nor is it a clear, straight that that NASA developed everything by itself. Well, that's why I predicated my question earlier on that list and wanted to know what you thought about giving NASA Houston a larger role on that oversight. Look, we've, we've seen where the same mistake was made by the FAA in deferring too much to aviation manufacturers when it came to the oversight. So, and we have huge technological advances. And so there's a lot to know and to be tested. So we need to get, have this structure. I want a very strong NASA oversight of these companies, very strong. I am not supportive of NASA stepping away and turning it over to the commercial side. But we have to figure out what that looks like from an authorizing perspective and put that in a piece of paper. Dr. Mr. Gold or Dr. Dittmar? I would just add quickly with regard to the lander, um, I don't know what the particular ask, rationale is underlying the, the various positions, um, but one thing that might be pointed out is if NASA is um, engendering, and I'm in agreement with Jim, I think we need at least well, two would be good. We definitely need redundant capability um, if we're going to take this approach. If you need to do a path, basically. Um, so if you're going to do that, you know, one thing the government can always do is assert what amounts to eminent domain right at first use um, so that if um, and I'm speculating, if the issue having to do with the public lander has to do with whether or not the government could count on being able to use it as it saw fit, um, in the same way that it can with regard to a government-loaned asset. And there's been a great deal of discussion. I'm one of the people having the discussion over the last several years having to do with what's the appropriate role of government in signaling, in particular to international allies, as, as Mike's already pointed out, and adversaries, um, what, what's the full faith and measure of the U.S. Congress mean, and what's the difference between how it is that you see a government-owned asset versus so public public asset, okay, versus how you see a privately owned asset? Maybe one way to have the discussion is to talk about what rights the government has to assert in the case where it needs to use, okay, um, and to in fact basically say to private companies, sorry, we understand you have other customers, we understand you have business agendas, but we have to set those aside under these circumstances. I don't know if that's a path forward, but it's just an idea. Well, I think oversight is a question here. My sense is there is a feeling of loss of oversight with these commercializations. And as I said, we've dealt very deeply with this as it relates to 
to the FAA and to the manufacturers. And you had a lot of people even within the organization at the FAA stepping away saying, oh, they know better, let them go ahead. Yeah. And we need a very strong NASA and very strong NASA oversight. I believe to do that, what you also need to have, and, and, and when you think about authorization, is very clear statement of objectives. What are the objectives, okay, insofar as how the government sees them and how Congress sees them? Because without that, it's very difficult to even be able to begin to do oversight because you know what objectives you're trying to meet. Yeah. You and, couldn't have said it better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Senator, perhaps you have the solution already in terms of the compromise with the House relative to oversight. I believe the question of government versus commercial is a false dichotomy, that we're stronger when we're working together. As you know, Marilyn mentioned, Dr. Dittmar, that NASA's got so much incredible experience in the private sector is innovation, dollars, affordability. We need to combine that effectively and hopefully going to the House, bolstering oversight and insight of the programs and having two entities moving forward, I hope could address the issues that they're raising. I, I, you're raising an interesting point, but I think no one's against companies going out there and doing commercial space travel. Okay, go for it. But we're talking about how we're now going to conduct our next Artemis mission. Mr. Chairman, you've been so uh, lenient, and I see my colleague has returned, so I'm sure there are more questions by my other colleagues. Thank you so much to the witnesses, and thank you for your diligence on trying to get this uh, authorization over the goal line. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I was copiously taking notes, as I trust you all were, with her questions. Uh, I also have to vote, so I'm gonna turn this, uh, the chairing of this meeting over to <clears throat> Senator Lummis, uh, our ranking member, and then she will proceed, but I will be back. So, you know, don't think you're going anywhere soon. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again, panelists, for tolerating our vote series that's interrupting the conversation. Um, former Congressman Bridenstine remembers those days very well. Um, first question is for Mr. Gold, um, and it, it has to do with the importance of strong public-private partnerships and a good line of communication between NASA and the commercial space industry, particularly on regulatory and policy issues. Um, so Mr. Gold, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the importance of the NASA Advisory Council's Regulatory Policy Committee. Thank you, Senator. Public-private partnerships in America are the envy of the world. It is incredible, this really second golden age that we're having in space due to not just the private sector, but the support that NASA has given, that combination of capabilities. Elon Musk has gone on the record that there wouldn't be a SpaceX if it wasn't for NASA. So being able to combine public and private sector benefits and advantages is so critical. And one of the other aspects that separates us out from foreign competition, other nations, are FACAs, the Federal Advisory Committees, uh -huh. that we have an explicit and official ability to combine private sector feedback and advice. And in this world, as Senator Cantwell just mentioned, where we're dealing with some pretty extraordinarily policy issues, the NAC Regulatory and Policy Committee is really the only place where NASA can go to get private sector feedback that represents not just companies that you know, are uh, new, like SpaceX and Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, but also Boeing and Lockheed, the traditional and terrific space companies uh, that have brought us so far. So having that common ground where both the new and the traditional space companies can come together to advise NASA is just critical and will allow us to leverage the power of the private sector in support of NASA's goals. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Well, thanks. That's a pr pretty strong statement in, in favor of uh, their work. So thank you. The embarrassing thing to me, Senator, is that two of the members of that committee are now astronauts uh, that we had. So I'm falling behind my colleagues who are on that committee. So Audrey <laughs> Powers and Sarisha Bandler. No worries. You bring your own qualities to that. Um, how would you say, this is for anyone who wishes to jump in on it, how would you say China and Russia manage their orbital debris? And are there things we can do to encourage them to do more? So uh, everybody claims that they follow the, you know, the, the guidelines that NASA creates and is adopted broadly by the US government. And then you know, it goes and, and goes to international fora and, and people say, 
you know, we all agree on these guidelines. Um, in practice, uh, do all nations follow those guidelines? Absolutely not. Um, and so that's a challenge. It's one of the reasons when I was the NASA administrator, um, I got Mike Gold in, engaged in, in the Artemis Accords. We, we needed to use the Artemis program, and I think this is an important thing. We, we look at the Artemis program, we get all these countries that want to be part of the Artemis program. How do we leverage that to create um, an international environment that is conducive for the future of human spaceflight? And so we, we put in there that you had to adhere to the debris mitigation guidelines that are set forth by, by NASA. Um, and interestingly, everybody has already agreed to that, so nobody could ultimately disagree. But here's the thing, if you want to participate in Artemis, now you're committed. You got to follow these guidelines. And I think, so the, the question is, how do you, how do you compel other nations to follow what the guidelines are. And, oh, by the way, and this is another challenge that we have, as I mentioned in my opening statement, in this country we have, you know, these mega constellations now that are also placing at risk low Earth orbit. And I'm not naming any one. There's a lot of them in this country. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of other countries that have constellations as well. Rwanda, as I mentioned, 327,000 satellites being filed for at the ITU. Um, so we don't have the authority as a nation to turn around and tell other countries you're not allowed to have your own constellation when we ourselves are licensing exactly the same thing. Yes. That's it. So the, the solution set, Ranking Member Lummis, is to recognize that there is a limitation to how much stuff can be put into any orbital shell. There's a limitation there. Once that, and by the way, I don't know that that's been recognized by anybody at this point, but once it is recognized, we need to define what those limitations are. And those limitations can be determined by the, the cross-section or the size of the satellite, um, the mass of the satellite. Um, so, so we think about how, how much stuff can you put in any orbital regime, and then we say, okay, now that we know that there's a limitation, we've defined what that limitation is, there needs to be a process by which we allocate access. When I say we, there needs to be an international kind of effort to this, where access is allocated in, a, in an orderly way, and when the United States gets its allocation, that, that we, in fact, do allocate in a market competitive way, where we allow access to a, a number of different companies that are trying to accomplish the same thing, so we don't end up with monopolistic behavior. Um, I, I really think, if you look at the, the kind of the way the ITU works for geostationary orbit, I think that that might be a good model for, for low Earth, or it, 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 it's gonna have to be, because the other result is this. We're all launching stuff into space, and it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be not good. It's a it's a race. Yeah. And when you have a race like this, and everybody's operating, um, it's the prisoner's dilemma. Everybody's operating uh, to benefit themselves, and at the end, everybody loses. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the the tragedy of the commons. Um, and I think that's what we're facing right now in low Earth orbit. And there is no regulatory regime that manages it appropriately, and there's certainly not an international regime to manage it appropriately. Okay, so the ITU is... Uh, International Tele Telecommunications Union, it's a subset of the, of the UN. And would the UN be the proper um, organization to also be the umbrella organization <laughs> for this? Well, so, um, wow. <laughs> um, it's a challenge for sure because uh, I, would, I would say that the ITU works. And, and I'll tell you why. We, and Mike and I were just talking about this earlier. Um, there are countries that are at war with each other that want to have a satellite in geostationary orbit, and they go to the ITU to work it out. Mm. So uh, it works, and it has, it has worked very well in geostationary orbit. Uh, right now, there is nothing for low Earth orbit, and I think that's a problem. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this before we move on? Yeah. Senator, if I may. Space should be about joy and discovery, not danger and fear. Mm -hmm. And per your question about China and Russia, that's what we're getting with their debris. You know, now I'm going to steal from uh, the former administrator there who would often talk, and we would be remiss if we didn't mention ASAT testing in the context of this discussion, that due to a Chinese ASAT test, there's debris that's still up there, and I believe it was America that had to warn China that there was debris created by their own ASAT test that was threatening their own space station. You know, the former minister would always point that out. Mm -hmm. So they are not particularly responsible actors. There's Chinese 
you know, debris that comes down from every launch. We don't know where it's going to land often. In the last couple of launches, it could have even hit America. We don't know. So as Jim was describing what we need to do, and I don't think the UN is the entity to do it in, at least initially, we need to do what we've done with the Artemis Accords, and I'm still grateful for the administrator, former administrator for that opportunity, is to build a coalition of the willing in terms of what good looks like. Lead by example on the debris issue, and then use that to force United Nations or form a new kind of ITU to be able to develop it. Also, debris represents not just a problem, but as a private sector Redwire guy, it's an opportunity to innovate, to develop new technologies that can address this issue. We should have active debris removal missions so that we can develop new systems that not only will help address the debris problems, but create new satellite technologies and other systems that can benefit a wide variety of economic and national security areas for the country. Mr. Bridenstein. I, 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 first of all, I want to double down on what he said. I, I think he, Mike is exactly right. Mr. Gold, as his name tag says, is exactly right. When we talk about, um, th think about the FAA, and we go back to the 1950s when the FAA was created. Um, in, in those days, uh, the United States did it alone, and we were making great advances, and it, it worked. We were able to have a lot more airplanes into a lot less space. Um, in interestingly, because we took the lead, and we took that model around the world, an organization formed called ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, and they took the leadership of the FAA and they applied it globally. So now when I fly my airplane, I'm Navy pilot by trade, when I fly my airplane all over the world, I know exactly how to fly in whatever country I go to because we're all following the same rules. But it, it wouldn't have happened if we would have you know, gone to you know, some international organization and said, here's what we need to do and try to get agreement from our competitors. That wouldn't have worked. But when the United States takes the lead, um, ultimately there becomes a standard that the other countries can join. And I think that's exactly the idea that Mike was talking about just a few seconds ago. We have to lead on this. And when we do, uh, I think we're absolutely going to you know, sh re change the world so that all of those constellations that we all believe in for low latency, high throughput communications can be successful. Well, um, this is a fascinating subject and I hope to pursue it further, but um, I want to uh, recognize my colleague. This is old home week. Um, not only is Mr. Bridenstine a, a, a former congressman, but of course, uh, so is uh, the gentleman from New Mexico. Um, Senator Lujan, who we recognize now. Thank you to our ranking member um, and to our chair for this important hearing. Um, holding this hearing matters to us, not just here in America, but in New Mexico. Now, in New Mexico, we have an incredible innovation ecosystem that supports the space industry. There's substantial research being done at the universities, the Air Force Research Labs, the Satellite Space Operations Office, and two of our three NNSA Department of Energy National Laboratories. We have the home to the first commercial spaceport in the United States, where Virgin Galactic successfully launched its most recent space flight as well. Now, to our former administrator and colleague in the House, Small launch companies are facing pressure as governments all over the world subsidize their launch industries. To ensure that NASA keeps a capability that many, including yourself, have said is critical. Do you think NASA should expand the scope of the rideshare office to be a small satellite launch office charged with assessing mission needs relative to all available launch options in order to determine the best solution on a mission by mission basis? Uh, so I'll start by saying this. When I was in the House, I was a big champion of the Venture Class Launch Services Program, which was basically a, a, a bill that enabled NASA um, to, to, um, to support small launch companies. In, in a, you know, when you're trying to launch a small vehicle to a very specific orbit, we're talking about 500 kilograms to 1,500 kilograms, we didn't have a capability uh, you know, five or 10 years ago to do that to a very specific orbit. So the Venture Class Launch Services Program was used to let the private sector know that the United States government has an interest in seeing the ability to launch small payloads into specific orbits. And it worked. And now we're seeing um, a lot of these companies develop that capability. Um, I would also say when I was the NASA administrator, we, you mentioned Virgin Galactic. I mean, we, we 
had value from the fact that uh, we could put our payloads at NASA on those vehicles. Of course, it benefited them, but it benefited NASA. The challenge that we had at NASA is, you know, you can get microgravity testing with drop tests where you might get a couple of seconds of testing. You can do parabolic trajectories where you might get, you know, uh, minutes, like eight or 10 minutes, uh, or I'm sorry, you know, 30 seconds or whatever. But then when, when you talk about after that, you've got to go to, you know, low Earth orbit. So a lot of these small launches, whether they're usually suborbital, um, there's opportunity there that I think, you know, Virgin Galactic, um, Blue Origin um, are making available to NASA. So I do believe the United States of America has an interest in making sure that these companies are successful because it's in the interest of our country that they're successful for a whole host of different testing and science reasons. Um, that, that being said, as far as that particular program, um, I, I would love to give you an answer, um, maybe do a little more looking into it and give you a more specific answer about that specific question. I appreciate that. And the next question I have is for both our former administrator, Dr. Dittmer and Mr. Gold. One of the bills that I'm working on um, is building off an idea that has proven to be successful with other federal agencies, and that's establishing a foundation. Um, we're working on one with the Department of Energy, one ex exists with the National Institutes of Health, um, and it's been able to strengthen public-private partnerships uh, to be able to attract that private capital and to make these investments. Now, um, as the former administrator and leaders in the private industry for space, do you agree that if we fail to harness the full commercialization potential of NASA, we will fall behind countries willing to do so? I absolutely think so. And I think, you know, my, my friend Mike Gold talks about it as, you know, um, our competitors in the world are never going to out-entrepreneur the United States of America. And the, the, the best innovation that we see coming usually comes from small, innovative companies. Um, and so I, I think in many cases it's in our interest to make sure that we have those public-private partnerships for these unique opportunities. It's important to also remember that... Um, that when we have those public-private partnerships, the goal is for those companies to, to go get customers that are not the United States government. And if they do that, it drives down the cost to the American government. And, and we need to make sure when we enter into public-private partnerships that there's still competition in the marketplace um, so that they're, the competitors are competing on cost and innovation and safety. Dr. Dittmer. So I would just agree with everything um, that, was, that was just said here. And I think public-private partnerships, you know, public-private partnerships, um, they've become, you know, quite the thing to talk about in space over the last 20 years, but they've been extant in this country since we started the country. Um, they've been used in a variety of different ways to create infrastructure. And we're looking for a whole ecosystem in space, right? One that supports everything from ground test equipment all the way up to orbital space flight and then beyond. Um, there's opportunities we probably haven't even thought of yet um, in terms of how to utilize public-private partnerships to advance that. What the United States needs is to be able to have enough strategic flexibility that it can pull whatever levers it needs to to sort of be able to advance the private sector as well as advance the government, um, government intention and, and have those things work together. So, yes. I appreciate that. And, Mr. Gold, I'm going to ask for you and Dr. Saunders to maybe submit your answers to the record on, on that particular question. And then the other question I have for the panel that I asked for you to submit to the record, we'll submit it, is the importance of spaceports and especially the example that I shared with Spaceport New Mexico about the continued improvements to America's spaceports uh, are needed to grow not only our industry partnerships, but also for safe and sustainable government use. So I'll submit that to the record. I want to be respectful to Mr. Blumenthal's time as well. And I want to thank the ranking member for your acknowledgement today. The chair recognizes Mr. Blumenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, nobody's going to out entrepreneur the United States. <laughs> Sounds like famous last words. Uh, and um, the idea of a public private partnership when it comes to space, the idea of an ecosystem uh, brings back memories of my law school days when people were saying we should have a course at Yale Law School on the law of space. Um, only at Yale Law School would anyone make that suggestion. And it was uh, dismissed as one of those bubblehead you know, um, imaginary topics. But there is no real law of space, is there? 
I mean, and should there be, should we be thinking about if we're going to have commercialization in space, uh, you compared it, administrator, to uh, flying into other countries, but there is a means of enforcement there. You can ground pilots. You can take action that provides enforcement of rules of the road, so to speak, rules of the sky, rules of landing and taking off and equipment and so forth. But there isn't any in space. And so, I mean, if there are three or four commercial flights going up on the same day, maybe from the same place, uh, you got a lot, you're going to have a lot of objects up there. You already have a lot of objects bumping into each other, except they just don't have human beings on them. And having human beings and having commercialization for expanded purposes, either of surveillance or other missions, um, complicates it. Should we, we be thinking about laws and enforcement mechanisms in space? So, Senator is the only recovering attorney on this panel. I may go ahead and uh, take that one. And for the record, it's not just Yale. I'm actually giving a lecture at Georgetown Law School tomorrow on space law. So it's certainly yeah, taken, uh, taken root. Um, I do want to open with that there are laws in space. There's the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. There's the Registration Convention, the Agreement on the Rescue of Astronauts. So there are a series of international agreements that set rules that nearly every country or spacefaring country certainly have agreed to abide by. However, there is a substantial gap that you're pointing out now where in the Outer Space Treaty in Article 6, it requires authorization and continuing supervision of private sector activities. And we here in the US have yet to define how that continuing supervision will occur for non-traditional activities, be it satellite servicing, which we've mentioned, private sector space station, orbital debris removal, rovers, commercial rovers on the moon, we haven't defined that yet. We've been using Band-Aid solutions via the FAAST and the FCC, but one of the most important things that Congress could do would address this issue, just create a process that's predictable and we know what to do here in the US, because frankly, it's a competitive issue. That predictability is key for investment, and if we want to keep our countries here and keep innovation and keep entrepreneuring here in America, we need a predictable, reliable, and transparent regulatory system for commercial activities, which we don't have explicitly yet. I think that's an excellent answer, and uh, obviously um, I should have been more, more definitive or more specific uh, in saying there's no law uh, there are, in fact, gaps in the law, uh, which means I probably should attend your lecture tomorrow at Georgetown. Um, and I realize that, that law is the least glamorous or exciting aspect of space exploration. But I'm very interested in your answer that, I, as in many other areas of life, certainty and predictability are very important for the risk takers and the scientists to make progress. Exactly. If you're going to invest, the last thing you want to see is an unpredictable regulatory environment. If you're going to insure an activity, you need that certainty. So I know it's not as sexy as fun, but it can be as important as any technological development to space not only occurring, but particularly occurring here in the United States. Spoken like a true recovering lawyer. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today, and uh, it's been very enlightening. I've been following it from afar in between hearings, and we really thank you for being here. The gentleman yields back, and the chair, the gavel is returned to the chairman, uh, the gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, um, ranking member Lummis. Um, what did I miss? No. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a couple people that are trying to get in uh, remotely, and luckily, I happen to have more questions, and I, I think um, Senator Lummis might have some, a couple more questions too. So, if I can re-enter the, the, the 
low Earth orbit of information. Um, and let's go back to uh, Mr. Bridenstine. You spoke, I think, compellingly about the overcrowding in Leo, and, and, and you didn't even really get into that whole notion of once you have collisions, how many more fragments are created, and that you end up with a cavalcade of collisions, and, and that that one that one point five percent really gets scary because if that's too high in and of itself. And and I followed your math of how we get to one in a million, but there's a lot of probabilities between here and there, and I think that that's it's unacceptable uh, when you when you begin to look at what how rapidly you could escalate. Um, so anyway, I think. Again, how would you look at what should Congress be doing? Who should be uh, have the regulatory responsibility uh, there? And, and we are all we're fully aware of, of the discussions there, but I'd love to hear your opinion. Uh, so the, right now, the regulatory authority for debris mitigation falls to the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, and that is based on a law passed in the 1930s, Mr. Gold could probably tell me the specific date, but there was a law passed in the 1930s that gave the FCC the authority to regulate spectrum. And from that, you know, satellites, you know, emit, you know, all kinds of transmissions. And so from that, they say we have the ability to regulate satellite, uh, you know, debris and orbits and that kind of thing. Which, by the way, it's good that they're doing it, because if they weren't doing it, nobody would be doing it. So they extrapolated the law to, to take that authority among themselves. I don't know, I, in fact, I'm confident that the FCC is not the agency that should be doing that. And the House and the Senate have passed uh, a bill that was signed that um, gives that authority to the Commerce Department. Um, th that has not been adequately funded at this point. Um, they, they need you know, resources to stand up a team of folks that can actually put into place um, the regulatory environment for this for this capability. So you, you, are you agreeing that that notion of having a, uh, a separate escalating one of the, the uh, 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 departments from commerce up to? Yes, uh, I know exactly what you're saying. So the Office of Space Commerce. Yes. Yes, so 100%. Office, that's the word I was looking for. Yes, office. <laughs> the Office of Space Commerce is right now under NOAA. Um, it's not, and look, we all love NOAA, but it's not their highest priority to do space situational awareness and space traffic management, let alone and debris mitigation and remediation, as you mentioned earlier. So since that's not, NOAA isn't probably tr tremendously enthusiastic about that. I, I do believe it is a high enough priority. It needs to report, the Office of Space Commerce needs to report directly to the Secretary of Commerce and be responsible to the Secretary for achieving the outcomes that we're looking for. As far as what the FCC needs to do right now, given the risk that's in front of us, they need to consider that even satellites that can maneuver do have a co collision risk. And that risk doesn't just come from other satellites, it comes from lethal, non-trackable debris. For every piece of debris we can track that is 10 centimeters and bigger, there's you know, 10 to 100 pieces of debris that we can't track. So they need to take that into account when they start thinking about the collision risk for, for, for you know, low Earth orbit. As once we recognize that there's a lot of risk here that right now is not being accounted for, I think it's important for us, us to say, OK, how many objects are we able to put into any orbital uh, shell? And once we define that, then there needs, this is where the international piece comes in. We, we recognize that there's a limitation. The question is, um, how do we allocate access to those orbital shells? And that we need to have a process by which nations can get access to that. And the United States of America needs to make sure that its allocation is, is of course, adequately spread among compet you know, competitive companies for a, a competitive marketplace. Right now, none of that is happening. It's right. a race, and the race is ultimately going to uh, result in disastrous consequences if we're not careful. It, it reminds me a little bit of the uh, old you remember the, as, as popularized in movies by Hollywood, the Oklahoma gold rush or mm. the land rush, where they'd all ride out and they had to stake off their little territory and they would be shooting each other. And uh, I mean, it is uh, to a certain amount out of control. Dr. Dimar, just continuing on that, uh, this importance of having uh, international agreement on how we are gonna regulate this debris that's, that's up there. And this is one of those things, I mean, the first thing when I have a nightmare is usually about cybersecurity, but this is now becoming, it's, it's equally imposing onto my sleep patterns. 
so how how would you look at at, at the that are what are what should Congress's role be towards building or, or, or go, moving towards a an international agreement on on the appropriate regulation of of space debris? So following on conversations that we've sort of already been having here around the table, one of the things that's really critical about authorization acts is that they are signaling devices. They signal not just to the United States what the intent of Congress is and especially its investment and continuity of purpose, but they also signal to the international community. So other countries look to see what Congress does. They look to see what is written into policy. Um, that's then expressed in an authorization act. And one thing I'd like to see, um, I'm in complete agreement with Jim with regard to elevating the Office of Space Policy, um, completely making sure that it is consistently staffed across administrations to the extent that you can. You can certainly express an intent, okay, um, and the intent of Congress, that it is adequately staffed and resourced with appropriate expertise, okay, and then it is a direct report to the Department of Congress and the head of the Department of Congress. And so doing so, while you're investing it, okay, with the authority to begin then developing the sorts of regime, you know, this has been, Jim's talked about one, you know, one approach, which is sort of to, to look at literally what you can get into orbital shells and start thinking about regulation that way. But to invest them with the authority to be able to actually begin to work in that way, just doing that okay, will convey to the United States how serious, I mean, how seriously the United States is taking this. It's going to also help. There's a big PR war going on. I mean, it is a competitive issue, um, but there's a huge PR going on, war going on. You're just basically going to send a message to essentially all the stakeholders here. All right, look, no, we're serious about this. We're going to start pulling this together. We need to develop a regime. We're going to invest this office with the authority to be able to do that. And it also signals to the rest of the world, now the United States is serious. We're going to take a leadership position here. Here's how is going to be, who's going to be accountable for actually being able to do it. And I know that that sometimes from the, from the outside, it doesn't seem like much, but it really is a big deal. You no, know, I, I buy that. And just for, as a frame of reference, the Office of Space Commerce, I believe, still does not have an executive director. So we're, we're in the market of hiring. So if you have networks or connections, uh, step forward and take one, you know, take one for the country, um, if you could. All right, one more question. I'll turn it back to um, Ranking Member Lummis. Um, and I guess I'll ask Mr. Gold this, uh, since we're looking at global leadership, in, in technological leadership, uh, you know, obviously leading edge technologies are evolving and innovating at, at lightning speed in our commercial space industries. Which technology, technology do you think are most critical to make sure that the United States doesn't cede the leadership role uh, to our, our competitors such as China? Yeah, uh, thank you for such a terrific question, Senator. There's really two areas that I would highlight. One is we're at a period where robotics and satellites are merging to create something entirely different. At Redwire, for example, I mentioned the Arconaut satellite, which is, uses robotic arms to build itself. We're also developing satellites that will literally print themselves, leveraging the 3D printing technology that we've done on the International Space Station. So when it comes to this orbital servicing, assembly, manufacturing, we cannot fall behind China and others in this area. And the key to developing that is more public-private partnerships. The other area I would cite is microgravity, that the microgravity environment is a whole new arena for scientific and commercial research. I believe it's why China is investing in their LEO space station, and we are just beginning to understand the biotechnology, the fiber communications development, new supercomputer chips. Everything functions differently in low Earth orbit in the microgravity environment, and we must invest and develop those capabilities because it's going to change everything. So those are the two areas I would recommend focusing on. They are good ones. All right, I'll turn it over to Ranking Member Lummis. Thank I might you. come back with one more question, but. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the strategies that China's been using to increase its footprint in space is helping developed countries, or excuse me, developing countries gain access to space. For example, in 2019, China provided satellite development and launch services to Ethiopia to launch that country's first satellite. So it seems to me the US is generally more focused on relationships with nations that are already space faring. Do you, do you see a value in the US helping countries 
without programs access space? And how do you think we could or should do that? Mr. Bridenstine. So I'll, I'll go first and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the others. Um, so the, the, um, when we think about uh, the value of, of low Earth orbit specifically, Mike mentioned a lot of items uh, as far as you know, biotechnology and things like that. We think about pharmaceuticals, immunizations, the ability to create human tissue using, using your own DNA, your own adult skin cells, we can use to create your own tissue for regenerative medicine. The idea that we can use advanced materials, we can create you know, potentially in, in the future, we'll be able to create an artificial retina for the human eyeball so people who have macular degeneration don't have to lose their eyesight. So th these are things that are being tested right now on the International Space Station. And when we seed that, when we seed that to China, if, if we don't have a replacement for the International Space Station, they're going to be able to benefit economically from all of those values of, of, of microgravity that we're not gonna have access to in the way that we currently have access to. Now, as far as the international piece, you know, our, we have built capacity for countries in the past. We think about, um, well, I don't wanna name any specific countries, but we have worked very hard on all of our international partners on the International Space Station. 15 countries operate the ISS. We've got you know, 19 different countries that have had astronauts on the ISS. Those capacities are largely built by us. And when we decide we're not going to have a next generation space station, which right now is the signal our country is sending by not funding the next generation human space station, I will say I saw you know, defense or the, uh, the appropriations bill for CJS, I think it had $101 million in there for LEO commercial destinations, which I think is fantastic. But, um, but that's still not enough, just to be honest. We need more. We don't want to cede that territory to our biggest competitor, primarily because all of that capacity we built for these other countries is going to go to them. And, 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 and they're going to start benefiting from, from that. Um, so we have to maintain the leadership here. Um, I think it's absolutely important. C countries that, when we think about Artemis and the Artemis Accords, we have been inviting countries that don't even have a space program to participate in Artemis in whatever small way they can participate. Because in my view, space is a tool of diplomacy for this country. It's something that every country wants, and we can help provide it. So when we think about the big picture, kind of how the, the, the nation thinks about agreements around the world, I think space needs to be on the table regularly. Um, when we, even when we do trade agreements, when we do any kind of large negotiation with another nation or m many nations, space needs to be on the table because it is a great tool of diplomacy that can improve our position. Senator, it's a great question and even better opportunity for me to vent. The intergovernmental agreement, the IGA, which was the agreement that established the International Space Station, it's extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, for other nations to join the IGA which has prevented NASA from reaching out to other countries that don't have space programs or have space programs they just started. The Artemis Accords were in many ways a reaction to that, that we wanted to create a vehicle that no matter how modest your program was, even if it's just a couple of graduate students, that you could contribute to this unprecedented journey to the moon. And in the initiation of the Artemis Accords, you had countries like Luxembourg that has a relatively small but mighty space program. And there, by the way, shout out to the embassy there in Luxembourg that's been so supportive. But also United Arab Emirates, which, again, has done amazing things in space but wasn't a traditional ally, certainly not on the International Space Station yet. So through the Accords now, it's so important that we reach out to developing countries. I was so proud when Brazil join the Artemis Accords, because that was our first Latin American country. And I certainly hope that we can proceed in Africa, where, by the way, China has been very aggressive in terms of international diplomatic development. We need African countries in the Accords, supporting not just the Artemis program, but sensible norms of behavior. And I think that's our best vehicle to proceed and get these countries involved. So I would agree that it's been difficult for other countries to join the IGA, but I would also point out that the ISS has been used as a means to bring many countries who are not space-faring countries into a larger community. It has, at this point, hosted, has national 
um, projects of one type or another for well over 105 countries at this point um, over its lifespan. And so it served as a tool of tremendous international diplomacy, not just among the original 15. Um, interesting enough, I was back, and I'm back old enough back in the days that Brazil was in discussion about that, right? Um, so this is very nice to sort of see that come around again um, with Artemis Accords. But so it has actually done that. Um, from the Axiom side, for example, as we're developing that space station, we're getting a lot of interest from internationals who see the commercial opportunity as a way to sort of bring themselves into the, in, into the larger community of nations um, that are flying, flying professional astronauts from those countries um, who are able to sort of use that. So there's a lot of interest. I mean, we're finding that just even from a business point of view, um, let alone sort of national interest point of view. I think if we cede this to China, I am, I am, I am alarmed, frankly, and I mentioned earlier that the reason I joined Axiom was I saw them as best positioned um, at this particular point in time, and I still believe that. But I am alarmed by what I see as the potential for a gap, which we've already talked about earlier. Um, I, and it goes back to what I said about objectives, right? I mean, in my written testimony, one of the things I said, and I think I said it orally too, is that um, you know our objective needs to be assert and maintain US leadership in low Earth orbit, not just in low Earth orbit, but in all of space. But when we're talking about low Earth orbit, that's always been done through exercise of soft power and use of soft power to bring other, bring other countries to our side. So I think it's absolutely critical that we continue to do this. Dr. Sanders, is this something you wish to address? Um, well, I, I will talk about the International Space Station and, and just quickly um, reiterate a point that was made earlier about the importance of having a persistent pers presence in low Earth orbit. We look at it from the panel's perspective on the uh, risk reduction that it provides for further exploration. And, and if you don't have that kind of persistent presence in order to understand the effects of low Earth orbit and um, of low Earth, of, of microgravity and, and the environment on the human physiology, for example, as well as other things, then you are not going to have the ability, you're going to have greater risk when you go further away. And so um, there's there needs to be that, and there needs to be a good transition period, a good transition handoff to whatever follows the ISS, and there needs to be something to follow the ISS, however we do it. Thank you very much, panel. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Lamas. Uh, Senator Cruz has joined us. Uh, are you ready for your questions? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to the witnesses. It's good to see all of you again. Thank you for your good work. Um, as everyone on this panel knows, uh, the International Space Station has been a big priority of mine for a long time. And not only is it a critical tool for projecting American leadership in space, something all the more important with the Chinese successfully putting the core module of their space station up in April of this year. Uh, but we've also invested over $100 billion in it. And to be fiscally responsible and prudent, we need to get maximum use out of that investment. Uh, multiple times, the Senate has taken up legislation I've introduced to extend the ISS through 2030. Uh, the extension through 2030 was part of the NASA Authorization Act, which the Senate, Senate passed unanimously at the end of last year. Uh, it was also part uh, of that same NASA Authorization Act that was included this year in the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, which was passed by the Senate in May. Uh, and so, and it's something that the current administrator, Senator Nelson, uh, strongly supports as well. Uh, and so both the current administrator and the prior administrator, we worked together on this extension it is common sense, it is bipartisan. We're waiting on the House to act. Uh, and we will see if and when the House does act, but at least on the Senate side, uh, it is 100 to nothing if this extension makes sense. Uh, and I'll mention to the chairman, so there were battles in the prior administration because there were a few misguided voices in the Trump administration that wanted to retire the ISS early. And uh, Senator Nelson and I on this subcommittee uh, took turns taking a two by four to, to, the, to the administration on that question. And it only took about 300 to nothing votes for them to realize that, that perhaps their position was not going to prevail in the Senate. Um, but we need to see the House Act. Uh, let me ask the witnesses, 
Look, I think we're going to get the extension done in one vehicle or another. Uh, it's the right thing to do. It's long overdue. But, but given the experience of the panel, I'm curious, technologically, from a safety perspective, what is keeping the station from lasting longer than 2030? from lasting through 2035 or 2040. Uh, there's a lot of expertise on this panel, and so what's, what's your collective judgment on that question? I'll go ahead and start. Uh, first of all, uh, Senator, um, the wounds from the two by four um, have, have recovered quite nicely. <laughs> And I think you're... To, to, to be clear, Jim, you, you were not the one advocating this. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm aware of that, but I was, I was part of the administration. Um, and look, here's the thing. I think what we're seeing now is that, um, that the foresight that you had at the time was right, because we are not ready for what comes after the International Space Station. We're not ready for it. Building a space station takes a long time. Um, especially when you're doing it in a way that's never been done before, which in the future will be commercial. I don't, I don't foresee Congress appropriating funds for a second International Space Station. I don't foresee that. Now, that being said, here's the thing that I think is important. Extending it to 2030, I know the Senate's already passed that, and I support that. Um, I would also tell you that there's no guarantee we're going to make it to 2030. Um, certainly, we should if, if we can. We have seen already a crack on the International Space Station. We have seen a hole on the International Space Station. Um, the, if you look at the outside of the space station, it's been you know, pelted by debris. Um, and of course, there's, there's always modifications, upgrades that have to happen in order to keep it you know, moving forward. Um, so it, it, is, it, is a, it is a marvel of engineering. <laughs> Mike Gold used to tell me quite frequently, we need to put it in for a Nobel Peace Prize, which I think is right. Um, it, is, it is a tool of diplomacy. It's, a, it's, it's been just a phenomenal capability for our country all around, not, not even considering how much science is coming from it right now. Um, so the, the key is extending it. Yes, there is a challenge. Um, we know it can't last forever. How far can it last? I don't, I don't think we, we have that answer. Um, Right now, I think it's, it, we're in great shape. Um, well, and let me ask a related question, which is what do, what do you all think is the timing for a replacement of comparable capability? Um, and, and when is that tri transition realistically possible? And how do we ensure that, that, that the ISS is operational, that we don't cede lo low Earth orbit uh, for a period of time to the Chinese that we maintain U.S. leadership continuously there. So the, the future is going to depend on how much it gets funded. <laughs> right now, it has been funded um, at nothing compared to what it needs. I think it was like $15 million or something like that uh, for the transition to a new commercial you know, space station. But what we need, and, and the, the CGS appropriations bill had $101 million, which met the president's budget request. Uh, that coming from the Senate. Um, the Senate had $101 million in there to meet the present budget request, which is fantastic. But I'm telling you, sir, it is still not enough. Um, when, when we think about how long it takes to develop a space station, especially a way that's not been done before, I don't know how long. I'm not going to give you an answer on the date that that. But here's what, here's what I think the Senate should do. The sh Senate should absolutely declare that NASA needs to tell it when it's going to, what is the objective to have that new space station. And then the Senate needs to fund the requirements to achieve that. Um, it, I don't think the right answer is to continue, first of all, extending the space station is the right thing to do, but continuing that in perpetuity, believing that it's going to last forever, I think is not the right approach. And I'm not suggesting that's what the right. Senate is doing at all. Um, but N NASA needs to say, you know, here's, here's how we're going to replace it. Here's what it's going to cost. They need to put that in the president's budget request with many years, you know, you know five-year outlook, and then, and then come to you and say, we, this is the money that we need. And right now, I don't see that happening the way it should happen. And that begins with, a, I think, NASA needs to completely fulfill the spirit of what was written into the 2017 NASA Transition Authorization Act, having to do with the transition plan. Um, and a transition plan needs to have, you know, timing, milestones, clear objectives, how those objectives are going to be met. Um, and then once that's in place, then you can begin to have a conversation about follow-ons. So, as you know, Axiom, because we've, you know, we've spoken to you about this, 
Um, Axiom's approach, uh, you know, was funded on a competitively awarded um, uh, agreement that was negotiated with NASA. And that 101 million that Jim is talking about, when you look at how NASA is planning to allocate it, does not meet the commitment to Axiom for 2022. The work that needs to go to work on the space station side of it. In other words, for the station to do the analysis that's needed in order to be able to, to ensure that Axiom can reach orbit and dock by 2024 is not funded completely in that, in that amount, let alone looking at the, the creation of dual path you know, for having maybe more an alternative to it. So I would agree, um, definitely more funding is needed, but also NASA needs to be clear about objectives and the means that it sees at this point, understanding that any transition plan is gonna be a stake in the sand at the moment, it's gonna to have to be iterated upon, but it needs to be much clearer about what those objectives and milestones are. So, Senator, I don't know if I can enter this into the record, but I borrowed my son's ISS folder for today's <laughs> testimony, I'm such a fan. Um, we talk about a lot of recycling on Earth. And I can tell you that it's even more important on orbit. As you pointed out, and again, I appreciate your support and your two by four that kept us going you know, during some difficult times. We need to squeeze every minute an ounce of capability out of the ISS. And in terms of when we should be retiring it, I mean, again, I'm a recovering attorney, but you know, the engineers tell me there's seals that will wear out, et cetera, but there's still going to be good hardware. And we should look at, Yes, maybe there is a point of retirement, but continuing to leverage the hardware that we can continue to use as part of another system or as part of a smaller system. And as we discussed uh, before you arrived, you know, at Redwire Space, we're the global leader in microgravity research, development, manufacturing, the only company to actually build things on the ISS. And we're looking at a future with biotech and organs, et cetera, that you can build. We cannot seed those technological capabilities or the diplomatic or political benefits of low Earth orbit to China. So we need to have a two-pronged approach. One, extend the ISS to 2030, which I included in my written remarks, and then ensure that we proceed with enough funding and capability to deploy a free-flying commercial space station so that it's operational while the ISS is still there and we do not create a gap in low Earth orbit that would be disastrous for us in the nation. And as you point out, you have fans at NASA in doing that. You know, Senator Nelson, Administrator Nelson has been a great supporter. And we've talked a lot about the need for an authorization bill uh, you have former staff that was working on that authorization bill that's now over at NASA. So I think you've got great allies at the agency. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate you making the effort to get over here. Um, I think we're at that point uh, where I am forced by tradition and circumstance to let you go. Um, the hearing record will remain open until November 18th, 2021. Any senators who would like to submit questions for the record, for the witnesses should do so by November 4th, 2021. To all of you witnesses, um, in addition to my gratitude, we ask that your responses be returned to the committee by November 18th, 2021. Again, I'd like to thank each of you for your, your testimony today, but really your service in terms of maintaining or helping to create America's role as a leader in space, but also to maintain it. That concludes our hearing for today. We're adjourned. <laughs>